welcome to the Bible Study Hour. We are so glad that you have joined us this week for another beautiful study that we have. It might be one that you, you, you know, sort of a wonder, how do we get to this point when we are really studying for the entire quarter the matter of the great controversy? But you will see how it really fits into this program. We are happy that we have with us this week, as always, our two pastors, Pastor James Sundlin and Pastor Alden Mort. They join with me, Lorna Stevenson, and together we hope that we can guide you sufficiently so that we can get the essence of the lesson that has been prepared. But you know, our guidance is not enough. We need far more than that, and that's why we ask you now to join us in our opening prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, you have been good to us. Thank you so much for your words and for your Holy Spirit who constantly gives us the instruction, the guidance, and the right interpretation. And so as we open your word, may you use us for your glory. And may our viewers be blessed, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lesson number seven points us to motivated by hope. I think we can catch that picture clearly of needing this hope because of what has been going through all of the studies we have had and what is happening in our world and the fact that we are studying about the great controversy with things happening that, you know, we would prefer not to have happened. We would prefer not to be happening. We, we would really want to be out of those situations. Therefore, hope becomes essential in this mix. We look at our memory text for our focus for this week, and it's Isaiah chapter 25, verse 9. The New King James Version says, and it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Hey, that's a lot of proclamation there. And I suppose that is what is sort of, you know, whipping up this whole idea of hope, being hopeful about a situation. Mm -hmm. Pastor Mort, let me start with you. Yes. Um, when sin came in in the Garden of Eden, hope was dashed in the mm -hmm. sense of, but right in the Garden of Eden, God made a promise mm -hmm. to human beings that Jesus would come. As a result of that, hope was rekindled. Okay. And right through the century, we have seen the promise of the second coming of Jesus, the foremost thing that motivate God's people to look forward to. And so when you look in Isaiah, Isaiah declared at that time, and it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have long waited for him. And I heard you emphasizing the that day. Yes. And that day that you're talking about there. Yes. Is. The second coming. Amen. Pastor Sunlin. I believe that every true follower of Christ has this anticipation of something better mm -hmm. because the world is plagued with so much sorrow and pain and, and distress and there are persons who are asking what next and I, and I believe that happened in the disciples time mm -hmm. many of them having been going through the suffering ask what will happen to us mm -hmm. and the assurance is given even from before that time by Isaiah that one day it is going to come when the reality of their hope will be realized. They will see the coming 
of their Savior. And in our time, that is our hope also. That's right. That we will see Jesus coming back one day to take us out of all of what we're going through that is not good. Good. And so as we consider motivated by hope, let's look at this very special promise that you have referred to in the comments that you have just made. The promise of his return. We have some Bible references that we are going to be looking at. In fact, two of them, starting with John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Because in that passage, we see the promise there that is given by the very person who will return. That's right. In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Good. That's Jesus being quoted there in that passage. But we'll take a look at Titus chapter 2 as well. Titus 2, verses 11 to 13. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lusts, we sh shall all live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a, per, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. All right. When we look at the two passages that we have read, we see quite a lot there. But we are also reminded that there are other passages that are also recording, you know, why is it we can look forward to this great event and be hopeful in all of this? Pastor Sunlin, I'm sure you would want to comment on maybe the words that Jesus himself spoke or maybe some of Paul's commentary on this as well. <laughs> of course. Uh, Jesus made that promise. And, and, and notice the words that Jesus says, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Yes. It must have been that uh, Jesus considered the thoughts that they were thinking and mm -hmm. perhaps quite likely they had expressed some sorrow, you know, um, because he said to them before that I'm, I'm going to be going away one day. That's right. Right. First of all, he said, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to rise up uh, the third day. And he told them that he one day will be leaving them. And he's reassuring them, there's no need to worry because I am going, but I'm coming back. That's right. And I'm going to take you to be with me. And that, to me, is, is, is an important uh, promise and, and, and a promise that as believers we should hold on to, that Jesus is going to return, even though many persons don't think so. He's going to return one day. Why? Because sin cannot continue forever. And we cannot continue to live in a sinful world. Uh, God is going to make a change one day. Thank you. you know, I like this passage in the lesson. He says that this coming of the Lord has been in all ages the hope of his true followers. The Savior parting promise upon Olivet that he would come again, lighten up the future for his disciples, filling their hearts with joy and hope that sorrow cannot quench or trial dim. You know, as God's disciples through the century, we have seen suffering, we have seen death, we have seen injustice, we have seen everything that is wrong. But what propelled the Christians, the true followers of Christ, is the second coming, knowing that this will not go on 
for eternity. Jesus is coming again, and what a day that will be. And Paul says, you know, in Paul, Paul says that the dead in Christ, even when the pastor, the dead in Christ shall rise, and together with the living caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And listen to this. And so, he said, shall we ever be with the Lord. And he says, comfort one another with these sayings. Right, so with all of the destruction that's happening around us, we are seeing even when it comes to death. Mm -hmm. And you would think that at that point, you know, well, hope is lost altogether. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul yes. is saying, no man, yes. you will be comforted. That's right. Because there is the resurrection. That's right, yes. And that will happen. Yes. And you, you notice also that speaking in the Titus reference that yes. we had, that the passage referred to the coming of Jesus as mm -hmm. the blessed hope. hope. Yes. So that we, we, we have more than what to rest yes. our entire operations on. That's correct. Because if we were operating in an atmosphere where there was nothing to look forward to, then, mm. you know, may as well, we yes. stop and just give yes. up and... Might as well. Yes. Yes. But thank God... We have this precious promise that we can hold on to. And we can anticipate that time coming. We can anticipate this because it, it's what we live for. Yes, that's right. We're looking forward to it. Now, look at what Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 has to say for us. That reference in Acts, look at what it has to say. It's chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. The word of God says, and when they had, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So we have not only the words of Jesus himself mm -hmm. saying, I will return. Right. And not only the words, not, not also yes. with the words of Paul yes. saying that he will come, mm -hmm. you know, but... We are having here a scenery mm -hmm. where the apostles are being told mm -hmm. that he will come again. Yes. That's right. There is no need to fret and to worry. Mm -hmm. All right. There is something about his coming that some people do not really take too seriously. Mm -hmm. And they, they think it's some kind of a either fairy tale mm -hmm. or something in the mm -hmm. imagination or whatever it is. But we see that this is further made clear in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, about the reality of his coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Amen. Now, what is it that is being emphasized here that we must take as Bible truth and reality? The reality is that his coming is not going to be uh, some thing where it comes uh, uh, in, I would use the modern way of saying it, mm -hmm. in virtually. <laughs> <laughs> He's not coming virtually. He's coming physically. That's right. Yeah? So uh, we're not going to be hearing that he came. We're going to see with our own eyes. We're going to hear the sound. It's yes. going to be dramatic. And he uses, uh, you know, an analogy with the lightning. As the lightning, you know, flashes from the east to the west, so will the Son of Man come. That's in Matthew chapter 24. So it's a physical appearance and not just something that we will hear about. Yes. And, you know, as the apostles were told, just as how you see him going up to heaven, you will see him come back. That's right. Exactly. Every eye shall see him. him. Yes. 
When the lightning flashes yes. over there, you get the impression of it here. Of course. So we are, you know, it's going to be real. And one of the things that we are saying here is that in anticipating this time, we, we must do something about preparing for it. If you're yes. anticipating something, you're anticipating the arrival mm -hmm. of a relative mm -hmm. from foreign lands, mm -hmm. you're going to Prepare. make special preparations. Yes. Definitely so, so for this special anticipation, we should also make special preparation. preparation. Yes. Oh, yes. As we're reminded about, you know, the wave of things and how we study the Bible and how we get into knowing what's happening and what to expect, we are also reminded of some early pioneers who did some special study. Mm -hmm. In this section, we will talk about William Miller and the Bible. We are going to be looking at some references here starting with Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. It says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, Line upon line, here a little and there a little. You know, before we continue with the other references, Pastor, I would love for you to comment on the, that passage you've just read. Uh, the, the, the whole idea is, is, is in this passage that Isaiah is saying. Um, if we're going to teach knowledge, and if anyone is going to understand doctrine, mm -hmm. um, there needs to be a careful examination of what you read. You read a little here, you read a little there. So you can't just focus on one Bible text to get the proper truth and understanding of God's revelation. So check what is in that book, check the other book, check this Old Testament, check the New Testament, so that when you look at the overall presentation of God's truth, it, it is in line with what God intends for us to know and to understand. Yep. And against that comment, can we hear what Peter is saying in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21? For we also, also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto he do well that he take heed, as unto light shineth in the dark place, un, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, I would, by the Holy Ghost. Yes, I would love to, to, to ask, all right, with all of this that we have been reading, how does the account of William Miller come into, into all, of this, this. all of this. Yes. Well, of course, William Miller was uh, a believer. But, of course, he had challenges, first of all, in, in his belief. Yes. Uh, he was a deist, believed that, the, you know, God exists, but not in a personal way. But having had an experience that he was amazed about, it drove him to the scripture because he said this had to be the hand of God in this war of 1812 with America against England. And the, the 5,000 American won the war against 15,000 British. So he said, this must be God's hand. So he went to the scriptures and studying it diligently, mm -hmm. he recognized that in order for one to understand the scriptures, you have to search it. That's right. And by searching the scriptures, he was able to understand some things there that he didn't know before, which is an example to us that if we really want to know God's truth, do what Isaiah says, hear a little, hear a little, hear a little, hear a little. study it properly in and, order to understand. Right. And, and, and we are reminded in all of this too that if we do that, they hear a little, they hear a little thing, studying properly, that the Bible interprets itself so right. that we will be cleared up Mm -hmm. in our minds about certain things. That's right. and, Let and us look at... 
Okay. I was going to ask us to look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, to see what that one has to say, Pastor. Daniel says, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and mm -hmm. wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Yeah. So in the early 1800s, and you know, the, in the early 1800s, there was a awakening of the second coming of Christ. And you see where the William Miller went to the Bible, and if you notice that he used just a concordance and the word. Yes. So he allowed the word to interpret itself as That's he right. go into the scripture. Mm -hmm. And as he go into the scripture, the Holy Spirit That's right. revealed to him, you know, the truth about the second coming and, you know, yes. you know, the second coming. True. All right. And you know, the time is running away yes. from us so quickly that we really have to, you know, put a little stamp on the rest yes. of what we have for our study this week. So when we talk about some of the things that William Miller discovered by studying the Bible, we will also talk about the 2300 days of Daniel chapter 8. So let's look at these two references, Galatians 4, verse 4, and then we look at Daniel 8. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. That's a short verse. Yes. And the one I'm going to read now is also a short verse. As we look at Daniel 8, verse 14, it says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Notice how now we are getting into specifics. Mm -hmm. And yes. we are talking about precision. Yes. And we are talking about how God operates with precision. Mm -hmm. So, just give us a little comment on this whole matter of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Was this, this is one of the uh, very important texts that uh, William Miller came across. Yes. And um, as we've established that he was comparing scripture with scripture very mm -hmm. deeply. And so he wanted to understand what this means. Now, in his time, the popular idea was that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the earth. Yes. And so the cleansing of the earth means that it must be by fire. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that came in his mind that heaven is clean, so there's no need to cleanse um, heaven. And um, the Jerusalem temple is already destroyed, so there's no need for that. So mm -hmm. it must have been the cleansing of the earth, which means Jesus has to come. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion was that at the end of this prophecy would be the coming of Jesus and the cleansing of the earth by fire. And that was his understanding. But we will learn from scripture that of course, the prophecy is right in time, but wrong in the interpretation that William Miller had of, of the event. event. Yes. Right. So okay. the event mm -hmm. of Jesus' coming would not be according to this prophecy. Let's see if we can squeeze in a little bit more about the prophecy in Daniel. As we go to Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to read a few verses there. We'll read verses 24, 25, and 27. That's Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, and mm -hmm. I'm reading verses 24, 25, and 27. 27. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the, th the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in trouble in troubles in troublesome time. Verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, 
and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Thank you. There, there are several things happening in the passage just read. Mm -hmm. And we will recall that when we read chapter 8, verse 14, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we talked about a time period, 2,300 2, days or years. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Now, a portion of that time is taken out here, and the focus is on that to see how things kind of a gel and how the prophecy really fits into actual happening. Right. I give you just a minute to comment on that. So when you look at the prophecy, you realize that, you know, the, um, the prophecy tells us, you know, when, the, when it's going to begin, you know, when the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem. And we discovered that it was under you know, Artaxerxes that that command was given in 450, 457 BC. Mm -hmm. And so we see the start of this prophecy and Pastor will continue to. Good. And, and, and so Very good having, start. having yes. started in 457, mm -hmm. the prophecy says 70 weeks mm -hmm. are determined upon God's people. In other words, they had a probationary period as a nation, as a people in which God would deal with them. And when we do the calculation from mm -hmm. 457, it would take us to remember that a day, it's a day year principle, right. right? So it's actually 490 years. years. And so when we subtract that from the 2,300, it will take us to uh, AD 34. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when God would no more deal with them. And the prophecy came right on time even to the anointing of the Messiah, who is Jesus. Yes. Right. And also the probationary period for the Jewish people. Right, because uh, people. That, that verse there talks about in the middle of that week, that last week, the, what would the happen? The Messiah would be cut off. That's right. Yes. So you see, th there is so much that's happening. And, you know, I, I think that we have an apology to make to our viewers, viewers <laughs> this week. Believe me, because this week we would have loved to spend some more time yeah, in yes. more detail to go through all of this. But what can we say? I, ju I just want to say to our viewers, listen, it's a matter of line upon line and verse upon verse and studying the scriptures more and more each day. So we implore you to do some more study on this because there is so much in it for us to understand. One of the main things we want to leave with you, however, is that God's timing is precise. Mm -hmm. God's word is sure. That's right. And if we believe that the Bible is really God's word, then there's so much for us to learn from it that we can't stop studying. Mm -hmm. So we want to say, join us next week when we do the Bible study hour again. And we want you to keep on studying during the course of the week because there's so much for us to gain in all of this. We say thanks to our pastors who joined us for this particular, you know, you know, shall I say rehearsal of a little bit of the study. And I want to say thanks to our sponsors, Easy Deal Auto Sales and Tours Limited, and thanks to all who have made it possible for us to go through this abridged study this week. Join us next week, but before that, join us now, please, in our closing prayer. Eternal Heavenly Father, we just say thank you for your words. Your words are just light unto our feet. We ask you now that as we ponder upon these, help that these words will motivate us to look for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the viewers and bless those who are involved in presenting this program. Hear our prayers now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.